guys, my name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to do a video on the subject of atrial flutter. Okay, atrial flutter is a heart rhythm disorder. I'm going to try and explain to you as to how it occurs. Now, in the normal heart what happens is that electrical impulses are generated in a, a natural pacemaker that we're born with. This is called the sinoatrial node. An impulse is generated. The rate of impulse generation is about 72 to 75 per minute. So the impulse is generated. It then goes down to the atria and causes the atria to contract. Then it goes down to the atrioventricular node, which is a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper then allows that impulse to go down to the ventricle and causes, allows the ventricle to contract. So in a normal person, the atrial rate is around about 72 to 75 beats per minute. The atrioventricular node lets every impulse through and the ventricle beats at 72 to 75 beats per minute, okay? Um, in atrial flutter, what happens is that there's a short circuiting of electricity in the right atrium and that causes impulses to be generated at 300 per minute right so normal normal is about 72 to 75 in this situation you get 300 per minute so the atria start beating at 300 beats per minute now as these impulses then go down to the atrioventricular node the gatekeeper the gatekeeper acts to reduce the number of impulses that go down to the ventricle. So instead of uh, 300, it will only let one for every two impulses through. So the ventricular rate, therefore, is 150 because um, 300 impulses, uh, and if it's only letting one out of every two, you get this thing called two to one, and two to one conduction, and therefore you get a ventricular rate of 150. So the atria beating at 300 beats per minute, the ventricles are beating at 150 beats per minute. Of course, our pulse rate is determined by our ventricular rate, and therefore our ventricular rate goes up to 150 beats per minute in atrial flutter. Now, it can be slower than that, or it can be faster than that, and that really largely depends on whether the atrioventricular node is already being modulated by medications or it's diseased in some way. So if you're taking medications like beta blockers or calcium blockers, they act on the atrioventricular node, so the, um, the ventricular rate may be slower, but in general, we as doctors, as cardiologists, suspect atrial flutter whenever we see someone who's complaining of palpitations and their heart rate is going bang on at 150 beats per minute. At that point, we think, oh, this is likely to be atrial flutter. Okay, now, why is atrial flutter important? Well, atrial flutter is important for two reasons. It can affect our quality of life adversely, and it can also affect our quantity of life adversely. Okay, and I'm going to go through this. In terms of quality of life, atrial flutter causes symptoms and they can be quite unpleasant. In particular, um, the very fact that the heart rate rises very abruptly and goes up to 150 beats per minute can be very unpleasant. It would cause palpitations, it can cause lightheadedness, it can cause breathlessness, it can cause exercise intolerance, and those can be incredibly unpleasant for patients. So that's how it affects our quality of life. Then the next question is, how does atrial flutter affect our length of life? And the big risk with atrial flutter is that atrial flutter is also associated with a risk of strokes, much like atrial fibrillation. Having said that, the risk is probably not as high as with atrial fibrillation, but there is undoubtedly a risk. Why does that happen? Because when the atria are beating at 300 beats per minute, they're not really beating very effectively. And because they're not beating very effectively, they're probably not pushing out as much blood as they should. And some blood can therefore stagnate. And um, as the blood stagnates, it can form a blood clot. And that blood clot can then get dislodged and go to the brain where it can cause a stroke. Or it can go to the arms or somewhere uh, in the rest of the body where it can cause a reduction in the blood supply to that area and damage the vital organs. And that's why atrial flutter is particularly important. And that's the main reason by which it affects our lifespan. Okay, now, how common is it? Um, atrial flutter is relatively uncommon compared to atrial fibrillation. 
the incidence um, in, I think, in America perhaps is under 55 in 100,000 patient years. That's the kind of incidence. Uh, as you get older, the incidence goes up significantly, but still much less than atrial fibrillation, where the incidence in under 50s is about one in a thousand patient years. So you can tell how much um, less common atrial flutter is compared to atrial fibrillation. It tends to affect men more than women, two to one. Um, and the other thing to say is it's very unusual to see atrial flutter in a structurally normal heart. So the majority of times atrial flutter occurs either if the heart itself is diseased in patients who have a cardiomyopathy or heart failure or something like that, or if the heart has been under excessive stress such as in people who have bad lung disease, in those patients the, the heart has to work harder to try and get the blood to the lungs and you can develop these um, short circuits, short, short circuiting in the right atrium which gives rise to the atrial flutter. Out of 100 patients with atrial flutter, perhaps one or two will have a normal heart with no other comorbidities. The majority will have either a problem with their heart or their lungs or something else. Okay. Uh, any of the disorders that can cause atrial fibrillation can also cause atrial flutter. These include um, thyroid toxicosis, so thyroid dysfunction, sleep apnea, obesity, uh, alcohol, uh, and also if your sinus node, your natural pacemaker is in any way damaged or uh, you know, has deteriorated as a result of age. Uh, blood clots in the lungs can also cause this. Okay? Uh, so whenever you're diagnosed with atrial flutter, it becomes imperative that people look for those things as well because treating the underlying cause will help treat the atrial flutter. Um, the other thing to say is that atrial flutter is often seen in people with atrial fibrillation. It can often be a rhythm which acts as a bridge between patients being from if moving from atrial fibrillation to sinus rhythm. So it's not uncommon to, to see uh, a person who is in sinus rhythm, then they go into a short run of atrial flutter before they go into atrial fibrillation. Or when you're trying to get them out of atrial fibrillation, you see short runs of atrial flutter. So it often coexists in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. We see it a lot in medications. When we give medications to patients who have um, uh, uh, atrial fibrillation like fleconide, we often see runs of atrial flutter in around about 15% of patients who are treated with medications. Uh, how does it feel? I'll just tap out how it feels. Uh, normal heart rhythm is like this. In atrial flutter, what will happen is sudden, regular, very fast, 150, and then you come out of it. So sudden onset, sudden offset, very fast, 150 beats per minute, and most people don't like it. What tests should you have if you're diagnosed with atrial flutter? Well, at the very least, I think you need a blood test, a full blood count, and some electrolytes measuring. I think you should definitely have thyroid tests done. Uh, you should definitely be investigated for sleep apnea just because that's so common these days. Uh, you should have some tests to make sure you don't have any underlying lung disease. And I think everyone who has atrial flutter should be investigated with an echocardiogram because most patients with atrial flutter, um, as I say, will have some form of heart disease or lung disease or something like that. How is it diagnosed? Well, the diagnosis is, can only be made on an ECG when you're having the atrial flutter. So if you get palpitations and then you go to a hospital, but by that time the palpitations have ended and the ECG is normal, that doesn't exclude atrial flutter. What you need is an ECG done when the symptoms are happening. Okay. Um, now, what is the treatment for atrial flutter? Number one. The first thing is that in atrial flutter the heart goes at 150 beats per minute and it is important to try and control the heart rate to stop the heart going that fast because that fast heart rate can make you feel unwell but the other thing is of course that if the heart is going very fast for a prolonged period of time it can actually cause the heart to weaken. Uh, and therefore if you can control the rate you can stop that from happening but even if the heart weakens if you control the rate subsequently it can strengthen back up 
The problem, however, is that in atrial flutter, the heart rate is quite difficult to control. It's, this is unlike atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, it's relatively easy. We give them beta blockers and calcium antagonists and digoxin to control the heart rate. In atrial flutter, these don't work as well. And a lot of times, what we tend to achieve by giving them medications is converting the patient from atrial flutter to atrial fibrillation because they can coexist. And when they're in atrial fibrillation, they become much easier to rate control. But if they remain in atrial flutter, it's very difficult to control the heart rate. And it is not uncommon for these patients to require some kind of treatment to get them out of the atrial flutter. And this includes delivering a small shock treatment under general anesthetic. So in that setting, giving them a um, sh sh shock treatment uh, under general anesthetic can be extremely effective. Atrial flutter seems to respond really well to shock treatment uh, of the heart. Okay. Uh, the second thing to say is that the problem is that even if you deliver a shock treatment to the heart, it, um, we see that atrial flutter will recur in 50 to 75% of cases within a year. So you have to try and do something definitive. Medications don't work so well, but an ablation works really well. Okay, and the success rates with an ablation are around about 92% for one attempt and over 97% for multiple attempts. So that's really good. Finally, there is this issue of strokes and patients with atrial flutter should be put on blood thinning medication, not blood thinning, anticoagulants is the right word, should be put on anticoagulants because they have a higher risk of strokes. If um, the way you calculate the risk of strokes is not based on uh, the duration of atrial flutter or whether you're getting, uh, you know, how many episodes you're getting, but rather on your CHADS to VAST score, which is a little bit like how we calculate the risk in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, and if your CHADS to VAST score is high and you have atrial flutter, you should be anticoagulated and you should be anticoagulated for life. And even if you've had a curative ablation, it is still important to continue on anticoagulation if your CHADS to VAST score is high because up to 15 to 20 percent of patients with atrial flutter, even after a successful cardioversion, will lay, at a later stage go on and have atrial fibrillation and therefore it's best to anticoagulate them for life. So I hope you found this useful. I would love to hear what you uh, think about this video. Thank you so much for watching and all the best.